Hello teachers, welcome back. This is episode two in our series with Kennessy Davis about In the Shadow of Liberty. And again, we're talking about teaching about the great American contradiction, which is slavery. And I'm here again with Kennessy Davis, who's the author of In the Shadow of Liberty, The Hidden History of Slavery, Four Presidents and Five Black Lives. My name is Jessica Ellison and I'm a teacher educator at the Minnesota Historical Society. Episode two, absconded. We're gonna be talking about one of the most fascinating stories in this book, I think, um, about a woman named Ona Judge. And so these are some great primary sources that again, we will get back to after we chat a little bit with Ken about Ona Judge. So I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can chat here with Ken. Hello, Ken, how are you? Hello, Jessica, good to be back with you. And you're right, the story of Oni or Ona Judge is one of my personal favorites from the book. Uh, and it's an extraordinary story, but really gets at the heart of this question of slavery being a human story. And that's the way we need to approach it. Too often we teach slavery, if we teach it at all, as a list of proclamations and bills and amendments and arguments and compromises. And we lose sight of the fact that 12 million people at least were stolen from Africa. Only a small portion of those came to the United States of America. There were about 1 million African American enslaved people in America at 1790 at the beginning of the Republic. That grew to 4 million on the eve of the Civil, civil War. Uh, and of course, each of those millions is a person. And so I think it's so important to be able to focus on these five people, like Oni Judge, as symbolic of the people that we are talking about when we speak about slavery in America. Absolutely, absolutely. So in, in the first episode, we talked about Washington's changing views of slavery. So what happened when he became president? Well, one of the things we didn't really talk about too much, but it's completely specific to the presidency is what happened at Philadelphia in 1787. And I'll quickly recap this, of course. The Constitutional Convention in secret in Philadelphia, in the same room where the Declaration of Independence had been drafted and debated 11 years earlier, these men get together to, to decide the fate of the United States government in the future and create a new plan for the government, which became our US Constitution. Running through that whole conversation were two really undercurrents of debates. One was about the power of the presidency, how, it should, how he should be elected, how he should be chosen, how many powers he should have, should it be one man or three? These were really important conversations, of course. The other subtext, the other conversation that's constantly running is the role and the future of slavery in the United States of America. Because by 1787, while abolition had not become a large movement, it was certainly a growing movement. By that time, of course, uh, Pennsylvania had illegal, uh, made slavery illegal. And in fact, uh, in 1780, you could not uh, keep a slave in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania for more than six months without their being emancipated. That will come back uh, as this story unfolds. But the crucial aspect of this was, of course, the role slavery would play in the Constitution. As they made these compromises, large states, small states, representative, direct, they decided that slavery was going to be included in the Constitution in one very, very powerful way among several others. And slave people were going to be counted in the census every year. What does that mean? That means they would be included in the determination of how many seats each state had in Congress. Hence from that, how many electors would have be, they would have in the so-called electoral college. Of course, there were those who argued that enslaved people were property. Why should they be counted? Why not count horses then? Because they're property too. The slaveholding states, majority slaveholding states, 
said if slaves, the enslaved population wasn't counted, they were walking out of the Constitutional Convention. So it was a matter of compromise. Those enslaved people were eventually counted as three-fifths of a person, the famous federal ratio. And what did that mean in a practical sense? Well, it meant that Virginia, which had a smaller free white population than Massachusetts or Pennsylvania, actually had the largest population once the enslaved population was included, even if you only counted them as three-fifths of a person. What did that mean? It means that Virginia got the most seats in Congress and the most electors. What does that mean? It means that George Washington and four, uh, three others, four of the first five presidents, are slaveholders from Virginia. It's not an accident. It wasn't just that Virginia was so good at you know, producing presidents. They're obviously geniuses in many ways. We're talking about Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. Um, giant figures in American history, but their power came from the fact that they were from a slave-holding state, and those slave-holding states dominated the Electoral College for many years, even though if you counted only the white population, that was the voting population, uh, they would have probably not been as powerful. So this was the key, one of the keys to power in America in the early 19th century, slave power. It represented financial wealth, financial power, and it represented political power. And we can never forget that when we're talking about slavery. Was there a moral issue? Absolutely. People believe, many people believe that slavery was evil and it should end. They were basically a small fringe minority. So then, who was Ona Judge? How does she fit into this story? Ona Judge was the daughter of a woman who was enslaved to the Custis family. I think in our first episode, we talked about dower slaves. In other words, these were people who belonged to Martha Washington's first husband, and they remained with her until her death much later. Um, Ona Judge's mother was uh, a seamstress, a well-known seamstress. Uh, her father, however, was a indentured servant. His name was Andrew Judge. He was an Englishman who had come and, of course, indentured servants came under the agreement that they would serve and work for a certain period of time and then they would be freed and then they might be compensated with a piece of land. Andrew Judge uh, is more than just a footnote to history. He was a very successful tailor in his own right. He sewed George Washington's military uniform in 1775 when George Washington went off to Philadelphia to take command of the Continental Army. It's a fairly major footnote to history. But he's also the father of a child by an enslaved woman and by the laws of Virginia and most other states if you were born of an enslaved woman, you were enslaved. So this young child, Oni, as she was uh, named, she preferred to call herself Ona, uh, grew up enslaved, became a very talented uh, seamstress in her own right, eventually become Lady Washington's uh, handmaiden. The, you know, the woman who waited on her hand and foot, first person to see her in the morning, probably put her to bed at night. Um, sewed dresses for Martha Washington. Well, Oni goes off to, uh, Washi uh, to Philadelphia with the Washingtons, first to New York and then to Philadelphia when Washington becomes president. Uh, she is part of the small group of enslaved people that the Washingtons took with them, first in New York and then in Philadelphia. Well, Philadelphia, as I mentioned earlier, had a law that if you were enslaved in the state for six months, you could leave. Washington knew that law. Mrs. Washington knew that law. They circumvented it by moving their uh, enslaved servants in and out of uh, Philadelphia. Now, Oni was a female, so the law wouldn't have applied to her. But she could certainly see that Philadelphia was filled with free Black people. It was uh, one of the first places that freedmen had flocked to. It was a very progressive uh, city of its day, and very cosmopolitan, and the largest city of its day, certainly more modern uh, 
and, and better equipped than most cities in America at the time. But she could see that there was freedom there for enslaved people. She could see that African Americans could have their own lives. And one night in 1796, the 20th anniversary of the birth of the nation, just blocks away from where the Declaration of Independence had been uh, signed, uh, Ona leaves. She walks out of the house. She absconds. Uh, she leaves the house of the most powerful man in America, the most powerful couple in America, and runs away. And George Washington then sets about to track her down. And in uh, the book, In the Shadow of Liberty, I tell the story of Washington's hunt for Ona Judge and the role that enslaved people and fugitives played in Washington's life. And once again, this role of slavery in the early beginnings of, this, of the Republic. It's so important to understand this, to understand where we went from there. Did she ever return to the Washingtons? Well, that would be a spoiler, I suppose. But, <laughs> but uh, without, without ruining too much of the story, let me say this, that uh, Washington does find out where Ona ends up. She has actually got, gotten on a ship and goes to New Hampshire, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It's a rather extraordinary coincidence. Someone who knew her from the Washington household the daughter of a senator, sees her on the street one day. Um, this is uh, the, the stuff of great movies as far as I'm concerned. Um, and you know that, that news is then sent back to Washington. He spends the next three years trying to track her down, using the powers of the presidency to do it. Um, she is first offered to return with her children now and because she is enslaved, her children would also be enslaved even though their father was a free black man. Uh, she of course says, no thank you. Uh, I didn't run away so that I could just go back to slavery with my children. Um, this is a, a, a really important moment in American history as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned and is as important in many ways as you know, somebody like Nathan Hale saying, I regret I have one life to live. Um, here's this woman, uh, uh, an enslaved, probably illiterate woman, although she eventually does learn to read because she uh, becomes a devout Christian and reading the Bible becomes very important to her. So she learns, uh, gets literacy that way. Um, but she's saying no to the most powerful man in, in America and one of the most powerful man, men on earth at the time. Um, and that to me is a remarkable story that we should know so much courage to do such a thing. And I, I agree, this, is, this should be a story that should be included more in what we are teaching about early America. So with that, let's take a look at some primary sources then about Ona Judge. Well, one is about Ona Judge and the other one is not necessarily about Ona Judge, but the household that she came from. And I think we see a lot of these types of images of our, our leaders, you know, that it looks, idyllic and comfortable and wealthy uh, with these beautiful clothes with the, you know, the Washingtons with their grandchildren. But my eye is drawn to the man standing in the back. And I think about that man standing in the back and I think about Ona Judge and all of the other people that lived in the Washingtons household that we don't necessarily talk about when we look at these idyllic images of early American life. And so I would encourage teachers to take a look at this, this image and really dive into what do we see? What do we think about this? What do we wonder about this? Not only about the Washingtons, but who we don't see in this image. And then the advertisement here on the screen is or an incredible primary source. This is an advertisement put into the paper when Washington was searching for Ona Judge. Um, and it's not very long. The language is a little bit difficult. So there might be some thesaurus use here, which and dictionary use, which is excellent. But I pulled out a couple of lines that are in the middle. And I think these are really the lines that we should focus on when we're thinking about why Ona Judge decided to leave. And it says, as there was no suspicion of her going off, 
nor no provocation to do so, it is not easy to conjecture whither she has gone or fully what her design is. Or in other words, why did she leave? Why did she leave this powerful house? And I think that's an important question for students to grapple with is, you know, as an enslaved woman, she's living in the house of the most powerful couple in the country, but she was enslaved. And it was a difficult thing for the Washingtons to understand why in the world she would want to leave. And I think that's a great thing for students to really grapple with. So again, we have a list of great resources for teachers, including these primary sources and others on our document, which is bit.ly slash capital S shadow, capital L liberty. And if you have any questions, please do feel free to send me an email at jessica.ellison at mnhs.org. So thank you so much. It's been great. And we will see you for episode three.